Hi, welcome to PCF's online service. We're John and Kelsey Mullen, and we want to invite you to join with us in worship. Miranda's going to be leading us today, and Kelsey and I are going to be finishing our series on the book of Acts with chapter 28. So stay tuned. God bless you. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well and never run dry. Drink from the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table you will about all of his amazing attributes and just how how awesome and magnificent God is. And I just want to pray for us as we kind of enter into this time of worship that we really just resonate and, and see who he is and declare out those truths. So Father, we just thank you for this morning. We just give you glory and praise for who you are and what you've done that you saved us that you brought us from a place of destruction and, and death to a place of new life and eternity with you. And we are just so amazed by who you are, Lord. We're so amazed by who you are. Thank you. 
no matter what we're going through in this season, no matter whether we're going through loss, going through separation, going through any kind of hardship, Lord, relationally, mentally, emotionally. I thank you that you fight for us and you are our defender. And Father, I pray that we can just surrender and lay down the things that have been heavy for us in this season. And we just cast those things off and we just hand them over to you, Lord. And we just say, Father, will you just come and be the center? Will you be my center? I just want to encourage you guys to do that. If there's anything that you've been holding on to, anything that you know you need to let go, I just give to God. I just want to encourage you to do that right now. Thank you.
just thank you so much for your love. Um, that we get to just sit in your love. And I just pray that whatever anybody's going through today, <laughs> for from this week, from this month, from this year, that they would just be able to sink into your love, Lord. And as we listen to this message, I just pray that it really is impactful to us to get to know you more, to let you into every area of our lives. And we just thank you and we give you this day, Lord, and we just bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we go into our time of preaching the word and the sermon, let's start with prayer. So dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Acts and this last chapter. And Father, I pray that we would not just be hearers of the word, but Lord, we would be doers of the word. Lord, that your word would transform us from the inside out. Help us to take away what you have for us from this book and from this chapter. In Jesus' name, amen. So I have really enjoyed preaching through the book of Acts this whole year. We've been in Acts. And so we conclude it today. And Acts has been this epic tale of how the early church started. And Luke is the author. Luke, um, the first book of Luke is actually the book of Luke. Mm -hmm. And that chapter covers um, from Galilee to Jerusalem. And this book has covered from Jerusalem to the Rome. ends of the, to the ends of the world the known world at that time and it ends in Rome and actually Paul's life ends in Rome so uh, the book of acts begins with the ascension of Jesus and it's just an incredible story now if the book of acts would have ended in chapter 2 this book would have seemed like this fairy, fairy tale, tale yeah because it has this fairy tale ending in in chapter 2 but we see even in this chapter that there is just no no fairy tale. And this book spans about 30 years. So, John, why don't you tell us what's happening in the beginning of chapter 28 on Malta? Well, just to uh, refresh, we were last week in chapter 27, and uh, David Hobley did an outstanding job of uh, bringing a great application to the story of the shipwreck and pointing out that uh, Paul, as a carrier of the presence of God, had a great influence on what happened on that ship. In fact, he's probably responsible for saving the lives of the people on that ship. And his point was, it doesn't matter where you are on the social strata. You know, in this case, the prisoners were the lowest of the low. Uh, but because Paul was a carrier of the presence of God, he could have a positive influence and make a difference for the people around him and apply that to our lives, no matter where we are in the social strata, economic strata, whatever it is, we are carriers of the presence of God and we can have a positive influence on the people around us. And so I thought that was a great, uh, great sermon. And this week we're uh, still on the island that they were shipwrecked on. And it's an incredible story of what happens to Paul there and we see the supernatural come back, you know, again and again through the through the book of Acts here, and uh, especially here in chapter twenty-eight. So let's have a look at this map. On this map, you can see where Malta is. It's south of Sicily, and it's a small island. It's only seventeen miles in diameter. And from Malta, they will leave and go north all the way up to Rome. You can see the red circle where Malta is. And incredibly, every member of the ship crew, 276 men, they all survived mm -hmm. the shipwreck. And so here they are. They're uh, just shipwrecked. And I just want to paint a picture right now of what Paul must have been feeling in this moment. It picks up uh, when they are on shore. And so just tell me how you think you would be feeling after all of this. Okay, they've, the storm lasted two weeks. It wasn't two days, it was two weeks, 14 days. After 14 days, Paul finally encourages them to eat. So that means they haven't been eating. They've been fighting against the storm. They've been wet, seasick. Afraid. 
afraid for their lives, hungry. They finally eat a meal so that they'll have strength to swim ashore because the ship falls apart off. We don't know how far off, but so they either had to swim ashore or uh, kick on like broken pieces of wood to the shore. It's cold. It's, the water's cold. The water's cold. The weather's cold. It's rainy. So, I mean, how would you be feeling? I don't know about you, but um, I would just be ready to collapse. I'd probably want to just climb under a, a bush by myself and just fall asleep. But that's not what we see Paul doing here in this passage. Okay, well, let's read the first part of the story here, starting in verse 1. Once safely on shore we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed all of us because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper driven out by the heat fastened itself on his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, This man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, the goddess Justice has not allowed him to live. Of course, they thought it was poisonous and he would die. But Paul shook the snake into the fire, off into the fire, and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up and suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. So we don't see Paul in this passage crawling up in a, in a ball under a bush, falling asleep from exhaustion. Um, we see a totally different picture of what he's doing. He's, I mean, I could just imagine he gets bit by this viper, this poisonous snake. And like if I was him, I would be thinking, what now? Like you have got to be kidding me. After all he's been through, but he would have known that he wouldn't die, even though everyone knew that he was expected to die. So um, what had just happened to him on the ship, John, that made him know that this was not his time? Yeah, last uh, chapter, I believe, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, do not be afraid. Mm. You are going to continue to live and you're going to stand trial before Caesar. And obviously Paul still had this memory of this angel fresh in his head. And he's thinking about this viper as uh, you can't stop God. And he just threw it off into the fire. Yeah. And we see Paul, he's still helping. He's still serving. He's still um, not waiting for others to help him. He's, he's actively serving other people. Gathering sticks. Everyone mm -hmm. else is asleep on the ground and he's hard at work mm -hmm. trying to benefit the rest of the crew. Yeah, because he knows that the sooner they can get dry and warm, the less likely they'll all get sick. And it was a, it was a big crowd. So what we see here is another trial becomes another opportunity because Paul, he's inflicted by a poisonous snake. I mean, just the thought of the venom but just the pain also of the snake bite. And Paul uses that for good because mm -hmm. now he turns that bad situation around and he has the respect and favor of all these indigenous people. Of course, the Roman centurions and all the other prisoners mm -hmm. are pretty impressed as well. This man is walking with God. This Well, they thought he was a God. That wasn't the first time. And, and Paul's pointing to Jesus. He's preaching the gospel. And we're going to see what he does next is he's going to begin healing the sick. Yeah. So Paul, again, is just this incredible example of perseverance through trials. And so many times when we experience trials, we assume that God is not with us, that God does not love us, that he's abandoned us. But that's, that wasn't Paul's perspective at, at all. In fact, yeah. in a lot of places in the world, persecution um, is just a given. If you're a Christian, you're, it's part of the, the package. You expect to get persecuted. It's only those of us in the West who has the, have the skewed view of you know, a life of comfort and 
blessing and prosperity equals God's favor and love. But Paul certainly didn't live that way. I think he had learned by experience that God really does use all things uh, for good for those mm. who um, are called according to his purpose. So he knows that if he's focused on the purposes of God, no matter what happens, uh, God can turn it around for good and it can be an opportunity. So we have one more thing that's added to this list. So back in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul lists, of course, that was written before this. So he could have added many more things uh, in the book of Acts at this, in this timeline. But in 2 Corinthians 15, he lists five times that um, he received 39 lashes. Uh, 40 was considered uh, lethal. So five times he received 39 lashes, uh, which was very brutal. Okay, three times he was beaten with rods. Once uh, he was stoned. Three times he was shipwrecked. One time he spent a whole night and a whole day in the open sea, which I can't imagine. Um, he's been constantly on the move. He certainly didn't get comfortable, did he? No. Uh, he's been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger from false teachers, in danger in the country, in danger at the sea, in danger, um, okay, eight times he says the word danger. He's labored and toiled and he's often gone without sleep, he says. He's known hunger and thirst and gone without meals He's been cold and naked. I don't know when he was naked, but maybe when he was in prison or when he was out in the open sea. Uh, besides everything else, he ha says he felt that daily pressure for the churches that he was planting and the love that he had for everybody. Um, he said, who is led into sin, but he did not inwardly burn like everyone else. And then in Damascus, he describes having to be let out in a basket through the city wall to escape. So um, he has been through a lot. And then, to add to this... Now he's bit by a poisonous snake. He can add poisonous snake bites to this list. But, you know, there's that adage that the, the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. And I, I'm sure that Paul knew that at this point, that uh, God had plans for his life and nothing was going to... Uh, derail uh, the purposes and plans of God. So mm -hmm. I, I think he was uh, walking in peace that uh, people could not understand. Yeah. And he knew he was going to Rome. And he knew he was going to Rome. So let's keep reading on this slide. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him and after prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. When this happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways. And when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies that we needed. Yeah, I know that the, the main point of the book of Acts really is the power of the gospel to change the world. And I think that's even true in this chapter. But, you know, a sub theme here that I don't want to miss out on is the, the theme of hospitality. And, you know, this is a, another example that we see in Acts where hospitality is the foundation uh, for which ministry happens upon. Mm -hmm. And we see that again and again. Uh, often there's hospitality and then there's preaching the word or yeah. hospitality and then there's healing the sick. And I think sometimes we underestimate this gift. The Bible says it's a gift of God. And I think it might be like evangelism that not everyone has the gift of evangelism, but everyone has the responsibility to evangelize. So for instance, Kelsey is much better at the gift of hospitality than I am, uh, mm -hmm. but I still have a a responsibility to be hospitable. Wouldn't yeah. you agree with that? So actually, I have taught some seminars on hospitality. That's how important it is. In our context, in an international church, it's good to remember that we 
all from different parts of the world have different standards of what mm. hospitality looks like. So, for example, from for us from the West, we tend to have a higher value for privacy and keeping our own time and scheduling things on time and arriving on time. But that's not the way things are really in most of the world. So there's a lot of um, opportunities for misunderstanding or, or whatever, but it's good to appreciate this ministry of hospitality and how it's expressed in other parts of the world. And mm. for some of us, welcoming strangers into our hearts and our homes is stretching, but that is the ministry of hospitality. And you made a great point about hospitality was the foundation of how the gospel spread in the book of Acts. And I think a great example to you know, apply to our day is just the importance of home groups, mm -hmm. inviting people into our homes, uh, sharing our lives with them, sharing our food. Uh, there's a lot of boundaries that fall down when we share a meal with other people. And mm -hmm. so uh, I don't want to spend too much time on it. I just want to make a point that hospitality is really one of the foundational things to allow ministry to flourish in our midst. And so if we want to see people healed, we want to see people saved, uh, we want to see people delivered, we want to see people grow and mature in Christ, uh, we need to pay attention to this ministry of hospitality. Yeah. And it can be exhausting. <laughs> it so, can. <laughs> After five barbecues in a row. Yeah. yeah, we've been opening every week. But we we love it. But, but there's expense, there's a cost, and we do get tired, but it's worth it. But we see here Paul, um, he is exhausted, but he's still serving again and um, instead of resting. And it's amazing in verse 9 that it says, All the sick of the island came and were healed. So not only is hospitality an incredible theme in this chapter, but physical healing mm -hmm. is as well. So, you know, to think of, all the sick of the island coming. Talk about a man of influence. And if we could just highlight really quickly Paul being a man of influence. You know, you look at people on the internet today who are very influential. They're usually good looking, a very fit, very charismatic. But kind of like me. Yeah, like you. <laughs> uh, that's why our viral, our videos go so viral, yeah. right? <laughs> but, um, but there is a historical uh, recording of what Paul looked like. And I want to read, it's not in the Bible, but it's historically recorded. So I just want to read this. Uh, the quote says, um, okay, this person is describing Paul as a small man uh, of stature, okay, with bald head and crooked legs, and that... He had a good state of body with eyebrows meeting, which means he had a unibrow, and a nose somewhat hooked. So he had a hooked nose, full of friendliness, and the, the face of a man, but also the face of an angel. Mm -hmm. So here we have this influential man who changed the world. He was small, bald, unibrow, bow-legged, um, hook-nosed man. And that should give all of us hope that... You know, we don't have to use the, the worldly standards for, for being uh, influential. That Paul changed the world and he looked like that. So what else can you tell us about Malta? Uh, whenever I think of the, this story of Malta, I always remember the testimony of Suzanne Wallace. Suzanne Wallace was John's pastor's wife in Texas. And... Uh, this happened a long time ago, probably, I don't know, maybe close to 20 years ago, but it's a true story. So she was on the way to the grocery store, and she had to stop by her doctors to get the results from her mammogram. When she went in, they sat her down, and they told her that her um, she was diagnosed with a rapid, serious form of breast cancer. So Aggressive. Yeah, so in one, yeah, she goes from just going on an errand to her whole life changing. That night, when she went to bed, she had a dream. And in the dream, she and a friend were on North America coast with jetpacks, and they, they took off on the way to Europe. 
and, um, and they fell before they reached Europe and they were getting sucked um, into a whirlpool and they had to swim as hard as they can to escape getting sucked into the water. And they arrived on land and they, they were asking someone there, where are we? And they said, you don't know? This is Malta, this is the island of Malta. And then she woke up. So when she woke up, she looked and researched on Malta and discovered that this is the place where everybody was healed. And so she took that dream uh, with the interpretation to mean that uh, she would be fighting, you know, how they were almost sucked in, but that she would be healed as everyone was on the island of Malta. So we can't talk about this story without talking about physical healing. And physical healing can be a confusing thing to talk about um, because many Christians have all different views on God healing the sick today. But uh, what did what was Jesus modeling for us in the area of physical healing? Well, I think that the ministry of Jesus was to uh, bring the kingdom of God uh, mm -hmm. to earth. And that was the Lord's prayer. Yeah, thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. And so part of what he was bringing wasn't just uh, forgiveness of sins and bringing the Holy Spirit, but he was really undoing the fall uh, that happened in the garden and restoring Eden on earth. Of course, we know that eventually that will happen after the second coming. Uh, but even now, he demonstrated that as the kingdom comes, uh, we have authority over uh, demonic things and even over sickness. And so Jesus, you could say his ministry was characterized by healing the sick. And we see Paul is an imitator of Jesus. And we are called to be imitators of Jesus as well. And so if we're not pray praying for the sick, we are not fulfilling our call. That is just as important as preaching the gospel, I would say. And mm -hmm. often it precedes preaching the gospel as people are healed, they realize that God is alive and they're open up to hear the gospel message. And I think it's important that we remember that Jesus not only died for our sins, but he also died for our sickness. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, what do you think are some of the hindrances for people getting healed? Now, I think that it's important to note that people can sometimes get healed instantly they can sometimes get healed progressively, but ultimately, what is our healing? All of us, our ultimate healing, all of us Christians, is of course the resurrection. Mm -hmm. That uh, at the at the resurrection, everything will be healed. In fact, you could say that um, healing today on earth is a temporary healing, mm -hmm. but the healing that's going to occur at the resurrection is going to be an eternal healing. And that's really the heart of God, to heal us, uh, whether it's physically, emotionally, mentally, on the earth or, or after we die. His whole plan in coming was to heal us and to bring us to himself and, and to redeem mankind. There's so much uh, brokenness and uh, sea of suffering in, in the world today. But uh, when we talk about the hindrances to being healed, because that's, that is a big question. And mm -hmm. some people have walked away from the Lord when they, when they didn't get healed. But uh, James 5 says something interesting about what should we do, according to James 5, if we are sick, physically sick? We should call the elders and have them lay hands and pray for us. That's right. And it says, uh, such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick. And the Lord will make them well. But then it's very interesting what it says in verse 16. It says, confess your sins to each other and uh, so that you may be healed. So it almost implies that sin, unconfessed sin, hidden sin, secret sin, could hinder a physical healing. So he, he cares about um, not just our physical bodies, but he wants us to be whole, just like the sozo means to be whole in the, your mind, your body. To be saved. To be saved and 
whole in every way. Mm. That's the heart of God. Not to say that if you're sick, if you have an illness, that's not an indicator that you have a sin. Yeah. Uh, what Kelsey's saying, though, is that uh, sometimes our sin can get in the way of our healing. And, you know, mm -hmm. sin is not a big deal. Jesus died for our sin. Uh, we just need to confess it and receive God's forgiveness and forgive ourselves and move on. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's easy sometimes just to keep it as a secret, but James 5 talks about confessing your sin to one another. And, um, and if you are sick, call the leaders of the church to come and pray for you. That's what the word says to do, the elders of the church. I would say another hindrance can just be uh, the greatest sin of all, unbelief. Mm -hmm. And we're not standing on God's word. And it's uh, God's word says uh, that the truth will set us free. And it says that Jesus has come mm -hmm. to heal the sick. By his stripes, we have been healed. We have the, the, the power, the authority uh, to claim that that healing in faith. And when he said on the cross, it is finished, what what he's saying is that uh, now all things are possible. It, mm -hmm. It's possible for our deliverance, for our healing, for our salvation. Uh, Jesus has uh, opened the door and he's uh, paved the road. And it's just uh, up to us to walk down that road in faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's keep going on the story um, in back to Malta. Okay. They stay there for three months, and then um, they set sail, and they, they make some stops on the way to Rome. And we saw in Acts 15 that there's mention of the Jews all getting kicked out of Rome. But we see in this passage that Paul in Rome meets the Jewish leader, so I when it's mentioned in Acts 15, that was obviously a temporary measure because the Jews in this chapter are back there. So let's read verse 16. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. So Paul is in Rome. He's not in a jail. He's actually in his own rented home. And he is literally chained to a, to a guard to a soldier who is guarding him. I'm sure it rotated out uh, one after another, but um, it's interesting. You could say Paul was chained to a guard, or you could flip it around and say the guard was chained <laughs> to Paul. And, you know, I'll give you an example. We had a civil servant back in the day here in the Czech Republic. You could either do civil service or do military service, but it was compulsory, one of the two. And we had a guy who wanted to do civil service. He did not want to do military service. And he asked about doing it with our church, even though he wasn't even a Christian. And for our Czech church, we're part of a Czech church. And uh, this was kind of a big deal. You know, could we employ this non-Christian guy? And for me, it was like, well, why not? Part of his job is he's going to come to church every week and he's, he's going to hear the gospel preached, you know, and, you know, I'm sure there were some things that could go wrong, but I thought the best thing that could happen is he could get saved. And after about a year of coming to church and hearing sermons and being bored and reading books in the church library, uh, guess what? He started coming forward for prayer and took a while longer, I don't know, six months, but, uh, at some point, he confessed Jesus and started taking communion, and eventually mm -hmm. we, we baptized him. So a great example of here, those, uh, those soldiers who were chained to Paul, they were hearing the gospel over and over, and God was moving throughout Rome mm -hmm. by, by uh, changing the hearts of these soldiers. Yeah. So... It could be that you feel chained to something. Like our civil servant, uh, he was chained to, how long was he? Like a year? No, it was, I think, two years. Two years service. He was chained to that two-year service. Uh, maybe there's something that you feel chained to. Maybe you are at home with kids, and sometimes you feel trapped. Or 
Maybe it's a mortgage or maybe it's a job or it could be so many different things. Um, those two years that Paul was in house arrest, the, that confinement became his ministry. That was his, his confinement was his assignment. His mm. prison was his pulpit. Those two years in house arrest, he wrote these four books of the Bible, Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, Colossians, and Philemon. I mean, maybe he wrote other books that we don't know about as well. But those books are still changing the world today. Mm. And that was when he was confined. And sometimes our confinement is actually an opportunity. Yeah, amen. I saw this meme. It says, comfort is a drug. Once you get used to it, it becomes addicting. Give a weak person consistent stimulation, good food, cheap entertainment, and they'll throw their ambitions right out the window. The comfort zone is where dreams go and die. So see that uh, funnel there in that meme? That that vortex has, um, I think, threatened to suck all of us in, especially during the pandemic, uh, quarantines, restrictions. And that's something that I've had to fight against every day. But we see in the life of Paul that he did not choose to enter into that comfort zone. And he lived about, um, we think that he died somewhere between 66, 67, 68, which is old back then, life expectancy wise. And uh, he was never thinking about getting comfortable or retiring or anything like that. So I think that we could ask ourselves some hard questions with using Paul as a source of inspiration and example for our lives. So we could ask ourselves, um, during this time of quarantine, now that we're coming out of it and it, now that we're transitioning into a time when we really need to be meeting others, we need to be engaging, learning how to socialize again and all those things like that period of confinement in the COVID pandemic times, did we um, use that? Did we see that as an opportunity to spread the gospel? Um, or have we buried ourselves in this comfort zone? Um, do, do you feel chained to anything, uh, good or bad? Is there something, change that you need to get rid of? You know, we just finished our Steps to Freedom in Christ and prayed through uh, so that we could be free. Or are there things that the Lord wants you to embrace and see in a different way? See it as an opportunity not as chains, but as a source of opportunity for spreading the gospel. I could think of a good example was actually your idea, and it involved sharing our testimony and putting it up on the net. Yeah. I think you called it Testify Now. Yeah, hashtag and Testify Now. Many of us did a, a video testimony mm -hmm. and just put it out there on YouTube and see if it touches anybody's lives. Yeah, writing books, articles, sermons, um, meeting people, ministering to people. That's something that we can all do. If you would like to record your testimony, let me know and I can help you do that. Uh, there was a lady called Suzanne Wesley. She had 19 children many, many years ago in the UK. And she must have felt in prison in her home. You can't do anything with 19 kids. You can't travel or hardly leave the house. But um, two of her sons went on to transform the UK for the gospel. That was John Wesley and Charles Wesley. Wesley. So there's lots of examples like that. Or you have the, um, the apostle John. He was imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos, and that's where he penned the book of Revelation. Uh, he Actually, we will be preaching through the book of Revelation this summer. We've never done that before. We're going to take it up as a challenge. Not the whole book. but No, parts of it. So stay tuned this summer for some really great sermons on the book of Revelation. So here on this slide, you'll see a picture of someone's imagination of Paul rescuing one of his uh, centurion soldiers. Um, we don't 
know that Paul did that, but that's just put up there to contrast this comfort vortex versus this example of Paul from, from the book of Acts. Yeah, Paul certainly is the main character. We start off with, with Peter, but it's book of Acts is really about the chronicles of the life of Paul, and he does not like slow down for a life of luxury or you know he's a Roman citizen he's got some advantages and uh, that doesn't matter to him he's really focused on the goal uh, which is um, expanding the kingdom of God and uh, spreading the gospel message of course it might have been easier for him because he didn't have all the things that we have today to distract him he didn't even have electricity so he certainly didn't have Netflix and the vices and all of that. But tell us what happens in between uh, verses 16 and, and 30. Well, Paul gives his defense, I think it's like for the sixth time to, to Jewish leaders. And this time it's a bit favorable because they don't have any prejudice. They haven't heard anything about him. But just for the sake of time, let's just skip that and go all the way to verse uh, 30 the end of the chapter and you know Luke finishes the book a bit abruptly so let me um, just read verse 30 here for two whole years Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him he proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance and that's because Acts, it's, it's, it's an abrupt ending because it's not supposed to end. You know, there could have been a book three, for instance. Mm -hmm. Luke could have written another book. And you could almost say that the book is still being written mm -hmm. as the church continues to expand the kingdom of God and preach the gospel to the whole world. And we are still writing the book of Acts, which is incredible to think about. So we are part of the story of Acts. The, the kingdom of God is still expanding today in epic ways, just like in this book. And um, the book of Acts is a continuation of the book of Luke. So Dr. Luke wrote, um, we mentioned earlier, the book of Luke. And that was the story of what Jesus did, you know, in in sharing and explaining the gospel. And then Luke writes the book of Acts, which describes what the resurrected Jesus is still doing in the world today through the power of the Holy Spirit. So the power of the Holy Spirit is available to each one of us today. But if you could pick out one key verse from the whole book of Acts, which I would like each one of you to think through um, all these stories from the book of Acts. And like, I'd like to ask you, first of all, like, what is your favorite part from this book? Maybe you could write it in the comments, the comments below. But if you could pick one key verse for the whole book, what do you think would be a key verse would be for the whole book of Acts? I think I would go with Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that says you will receive uh, power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses uh, to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So you can see on this slide the, the, those concentric circles, which not just represent places or geography, they represent spheres of influence. So, and they also represent spheres where we go farther and farther out away from our comfort zone and what's familiar, out from um, what is comfortable. And, you know, the further away we go from home, from our comfort zone, the more uncomfortable it gets. We are exposed to uh, many new people, many new places, many do, new ideas, new languages. And that is, that is the calling for each one of us, is to go into all the world. And to seek first the kingdom of God. Sometimes we uh, spend our whole life seeking the wrong things. And at the end of our lives, we, um, 
we regret mm -hmm. wasting the time that we had on this earth. I, I want to close with this, um, just these two verses here. And they're from 2 Timothy. So Paul would have written this at the end of his life. And verse 16 through 18, Paul says, At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them, like Jesus, Father, forgive them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. And we know from, from history that Paul was most likely released after his first uh, appearance before Caesar. So he could have been acqu acquitted and rearrested for something else like the fire, or it could have been like a legal um, delay that Paul was released. And they would say he was probably released for about a year. We know that he wanted to go to uh, Spain and he mentioned a few other places. And historians think that he was rearrested actually in Troyes. And he would stand before Caesar again and be condemned to death. And so I think that's when he wrote uh, this uh, book to Timothy. And I want to just read verses uh, six through eight. He says, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. I think the point of Luke's book here is, could be summarized in this passage that Paul is an example for all of us and all of us should be uh, longing for the Lord's appearing and longing to stand before the Lord and give an account for our lives, longing for the crown of righteousness, uh, longing to reward Jesus with our effort in lives, giving back to him the life that he gave to us. What do you think, Kels? Like a drink offering. I love how he talks mm. about that as a drink offering. So it's this really challenging personality. Um, it's, a, it's incredible to think about everything that he went through. And it's, it's a big inspiration for us. It really raises the standard and shows and demonstrates that God's will for us can be discomfort. It can be walking into danger and all those things, which maybe God's called somebody watching to do that as well. So as we conclude, let's just pray and ask the Lord to show us um, maybe where we've gotten too comfortable mm -hmm. as we come out of this pandemic and we push ourselves out of our comfort zones. Uh, it may not be easy, but with God's help, we can do it. We're going to start meeting together soon on Sundays. Yeah, that's a good start. Coming back together, um, practicing hospitality, praying for the sick as God brings them to us, and just putting the Lord first and looking at every situation as an opportunity for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So why don't you pray for us? Okay. So Father, thank you for this series, uh, particularly this chapter. What an exciting time to have been. And uh, actually, we live in the same times. We live in, in these days between the first and second coming. We live uh, in the power of this same spirit that empowered Paul. So, Lord, I just pray that you would raise the level of our faith, that we could uh, do the, the things of God that we read in this book and that we could uh, make a difference. Our lives could make a difference uh, with the gospel uh, throughout uh, our spheres of influence. And I, I pray, Lord, that uh, this would be a time for us to wake up 
after this long pandemic, Lord, that we would uh, wake up and uh, get focused on the things of God. We just give thanks today for this uh, this story, this example. And Lord, we, we know that ultimately Jesus Christ is our highest example, and we give him all the glory and the honor. In his name, amen. Amen. Have a great week. God bless you.